Life was filled with guns and war And everyone got trampled on the floor I wish we'd all been ready Children died, the days grew cold A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold I wish we'd all been ready There's no time to change your mind The sun has come, you've been left It is indeed a wonderful time to be alive, a wonderful time to be in the body of Christ. What an amazing week or so in this house. The way that these videos have gone, the way that they've just changed, the way that they've just, oh, the way that they've brought me into more truth given these interventions from the Holy Spirit. It's it's truly remarkable, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about more about that in a second. I'm going to have this another go today at this man child video, right? We're going to give it another go, but no promises that we'll actually get there. We'll just go where the scriptures are, where the Holy Spirit takes us. And because it's a diary, I'm up to Ezekiel 36, just over there, Ezekiel 36. And Ezekiel this time has been... It's it's been interesting because it's like I've been looking forward to Ezekiel because I thought with these with these eyes that I've got now that the Lord's blessed me with now I was I was hoping to get a few more answers and a few more solid confirmations but it's it's tending it's it's doing a little bit of that but it's also raising a, a few more questions and something that's come into me a few things have come into me while I read Ezekiel he's going through those books around. Oh, those chapters around the mid twenties to to about where I am now, there's a lot of different beings that are full of wisdom and beauty. There, there was a chapter there, I think thirty one, where it likens Assyria to to a to a cedar in, in Lebanon, and, and just on that too, it, I'm just wondering right now whether the, the the Lebanon, the cedars in Lebanon, are actually the Garden of Eden because it's like. You read Lebanon and then it's connected with Eden and these trees and these cedars and it just what these trees, what the connection is there, I'm, I'm not sure. But it just seems that most of the trees that were in Eden are going to the pit of hell. It just that that's how it reads in the in those scriptures. But something else that I've noticed that's really that I've been trying to do because it seems to me that these prophecy books is all about how they broke the law. So the actual law was in the you know, Leviticus and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy and a little bit of Exodus. The, that, that was where the law was given, but it seems in these prophecy books it gives us some, some clues as to, as to actually what the sin was, how they broke the law. And I came into an interesting scripture here in Ezekiel 33, uh, 26. I only just read this now on today's read through, and just before just before I go on with that, it's a funny old thing. I just wonder whether these are like, is this the Holy Spirit or what? I don't know because I started this read through on the Old Testament on November three, right? Just the day before my birthday, and as as I've said before, my commitment to the Scriptures and to the Holy Spirit is ten pages a day, right? So my Bible is 527 pages long. And as I sit here now, I'm up to 481, right? So I've got, what's that, about 46 pages of the Old Testament to go. So I've got about five days reading, right? 
Now, as I start this video today, it's Wednesday, December 18th. So I've got that there's seven days right till Christmas. I've done my 10 pages today. So I've got, what's that, seven days to go. So I'm pretty well due to be in the in, in Matthew on Christmas Day. So I, I don't know, because it's it's really interesting the way the Bible verses of the day are, are, are coming up. Like I'm finding on Bible Gateway that the that the Bible verses of the day are all tend to be about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've, I've said often in, on, the, on this channel in videos that it's a funny old thing that the Holy Spirit just seems to be have me in the scriptures right at that point where, where he wants me and where he needs me to be and where I want to be because it's where questions are getting answered, you know, and it's just, I, I don't know, it, it just feels like another intervention from the Holy Spirit or I could be just imagining it. Sometimes you don't know, do you? You just have to go on and just, just keep praying and keep treading out the cord and keep hearing, you're listening for his voice. But something that I've done this read through of Ezekiel is I'm trying to find indications of where they've broken the law and link that back to the to the actual law that was given and see if we can get some more clues that way. And I'll come into this one today in Ezekiel thirty three twenty six. Ye shall stand upon your sword. So that's a host word, right? That's a host word. It's the spiritual war, the sword. Ye work abomination and ye defile everyone his neighbour. See that? Neighbour's wife. I saw that. I saw that and I thought, okay, here we go. And I knew this word neighbour was a different H number to the one in Zechariah 13.7 because I pretty well got an idea now of, of the scriptures where that H number is used because it's an H number and it's a word that's become very, very important to me. Because in Zechariah 13.7, the way I'm reading this, I'll just go over it again because I, I just, just to give it context with what I'm talking about is the way I'm reading this, and as I go on day in, day out, as I tread out this corn, this is become, it's becoming more and more apparent that I'm in truth here. So, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. So, this, this is the Lord of hosts talking, right? So, the hosts are the spiritual armies. They're spiritual beings just by the name of it. And the Lord, we're hearing now from the Lord of these hosts. So, we've got different names for Lord. We've got different names for God and Jehovah. And this is one of the ways he manifests. So this is the Lord speaking as the Lord of hosts. It's all the one being, but this is how he's talking as the Lord of hosts, right? So awake, O sword, so that connects because it's a host word, against my shepherd. Now this whole chapter is about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And who's our shepherd? The shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. And against the man... That is my fellow. And this is the H number here, right, that, that, that also comes out to, to, to the word neighbor. So here we've got the, the Lord of hosts speaking, who's the Lord of all the spiritual armies, and he's talking about the man that is his fellow, his neighbor. Now, who is he talking about? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ because this is what the whole chapter is about. We read it particularly in verse 6, and everyone shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, and he shall answer, those which, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends, which is the the, the Jews, the children of Israel, right? So the, this, is, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the man that is my fellow, the Lord of hosts, manifesting in the flesh. And smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn mine hands upon the little ones. And this, this manifests in the prophecy that we hear in, in, in the book of Matthew when the, when the cocks crow three times. I, I'm just so excited. I, 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 I'm coming into these books now. I've got one more day in, in Ezekiel to go and Ezekiel's just been, it's been great. It's been incredible and it's been nourishing but I, I, I feel as though more questions are now being raised more really, really exciting questions are just about, oh, Jamie, that comment you left, eh? That comment you left about the bear. I'll just go and have a look at it now. I have pondered about King of Tyre. He is the son of the morning, right? Who is the morning? See, this is interesting, isn't it? Because this whole thing now about son of the morning, and I mentioned in, in my response to you just about it really leads me back now to Job 38.7, 
when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, the morning stars, right? So the king of Tyre, he is the son of the morning. Who is the morning? So he's, he's, so every time now we read the morning and they rise early and is this when they rise early? Is this somehow got to do with the celestial as well? I don't know. But you said this to me. You go, oh, I just can't get my head. I can't move on, eh? The celestial hierarchy is much larger and complex and tiered down to legion boots. Now, are you talking about what that, what that spirit that Jesus encountered in the New Testament when he went over to the other side and they called his name Legion? That was the parable. I'm going on memory here. That was that was when he went into he he went over to the other side and the and the spirit come out of the man. And then into the into the swine who who perished in the sea, and then basically the whole town, the whole region, just begged the Lord Jesus Christ to leave. Are you talking about that? I think you might be. Down to legion boots on the ground, the feet of the bear. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean by that? And I just think, I just, I, I don't know. And I, I I I've been speaking to Shines on email, and and Shines is talking about just the the Jews think that the Gentiles are cattle like today, and I don't know. I'm probably not explaining this awesomely at the moment, but it's just this is the thing. These are the things that are coming in, and it's just like, and I said to you, Jamie, I said it, it just feels like. I don't know, we're just coming into something here, aren't we? We're just, there's something bubbling, there's something coming. But anyway, I want to get on with this because I really want to get to this Manchild video today, but I just, I, 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 will we get there? We, who knows? Who knows with the way these videos are going at the moment? That's my intent as I set out to do this video, is to do this Manchild video. Now, when we come back now to this scripture in, in Ezekiel, I thought I'd pop in this H number just to have a bit of a look because when you compare it to Leviticus 18, we can see that the command... Now, these, these are the scriptures that I've come into quite a few times where they, they reckon it's all about having sex with the missus of the neighbour next door and you can't be gay and stuff. And it's, 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 it's far more, far more profound than that. But this is where it's given down in the law here, right? Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Now, that word neighbor, that's the same H number that we read in Zechariah 13.7. And these are the scriptures here. So each time we read that word neighbor, it's the same as we read in the scriptures that I just gave in Zechariah 13.7, right? So this is, this is where it's been given in the law. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And what I, because of Zechariah thirteen seven, this is leading me to think that this is the Lord giving the law to spiritual beings that you can't come into your neighbour, right? You in the flesh, because that's what's happening here in Zechariah thirteen seven. We've got the spirit talking about the flesh, so it's the same thing here. That's that. That's where the scriptures are leading me. That's what they're leading me to think, right? And here at Ezekiel 33, this is where we see the, the H number here. So it's, it's H7453. And, and I thought, so this is where it's manifesting. You shall stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and you defile everyone, his neighbor's wife, right? So we return back to Leviticus 18.20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, to, def to defile thyself with her. So Ezekiel 33, this is where this is where it's manifesting, right? So you've got, so I thought I'd have a look because is, is it now a leap to think that this is the same thing? Even though it's a different H number, does this mean neighbor, we're talking about the same thing? So I thought I'd have a look and put in the word defiled and just see if we can see I don't know, just some more manifestations of it. And it's mainly it's mainly in Ezekiel where we do see it. And we see here in Ezekiel 18.6, and, and hath not eaten up the mountain, eaten upon the mountains, neither have lifted up his eyes to the idols, right? So here we go with the idols and the host worship and fearing other gods and the like. Neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither have come near a menstruous woman. So I read that. I read that and I thought a menstruous woman because there's there's undeniable connections going on here where it's good for the Lord how many children of Israel there are, right? So when they wax great, 
it's good for the Lord, and this is where he does good work for them. And we read in Deuteronomy 32 that the that the Lord's portion, that he separated the sons of Adam, he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds according to the number of the children of Israel, right? So the amount of, of the children of Israel they are is good for the Lord because Jacob's a lot of his inheritance. And when they're going bad, that's when that's when he he when they're sinning. That's that's when he turns his back on them, right? He turns his back on the children of Israel, and that's where there seems to be the most evil in the world, which is where I think we are now, because there's not a lot of children of Israel around, a lot of people who are following the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I think that the, the, his inheritance on the earth is I don't know it's 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 down. That's where that's just where the scriptures are leading me. So when you see this word a menstruous woman, that means when they're menstruous, right? That means they're not having children. So that's that's a bad thing. So this menstruous woman isn't a good thing. So I thought I'd have a look. I thought I'd have a look at this word menstruous, and it basically means these things. But filthiness, menstruous, set apart. Impurity of ceremonial impurity of menstruation, an impure thing of idolatry and immorality. Right, so it means something far, far greater than what we're talking about. But I've seen here speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and have born a man child, I thought, Oh, here we go. If the children, if they have bought a man-child, and this man-child, this is the word that we're talking about today in this video, male and female created he them, right? So if he, if the woman have conceived seed and bought a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of the separation, for her infirmity shall be unclean. So now we're coming back to into the into the law again, right? into all of this clean, unclean. So it's very, very exciting where all this is taking me. So we'll see where we can go on this video to see if we actually we actually get there. But as I say a little bit earlier, those last two videos have just been the most incredible experience. I can't get my head around just how much the Holy Spirit has moved. Uh, about three videos ago, not, not including the one where I went down on the beach, that was just a bit of fun. I just felt like venting that day because you just get... It's just so stupid when you've got eyes that see, ears that hear, doesn't it? It's it just you see the lies and you see the stupidity of the Masonic science. So I thought I'd just do that video that day, but but the one two videos a day, the seed of the woman one, boy oh boy, that was meant to be this video now, and the one that I just completed that I just put down, and that ended up turning just as just a, a, an hour long message about the gospel, the things that I didn't even know before I started the video. And that video was just a 20 minute intro to this one and it turned into a video all on its own that led me to the gospel and relates to the Jesus Christ. So I couldn't believe it. It's just been absolutely, absolutely, absolutely massive. Just so much came out of it and a big one that came out of it was just this word, just this word grass and ox and that scripture in Psalms 1620 that, that, that came, to, came to pass during that video and they changed their glory, didn't they? They changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. So the children of Israel, they were in a glorious state by the looks. And they changed their similitude of an ox. So what did they worship? What did they worship in the wilderness? They worshipped that calf, didn't they? In Genesis 1.11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass. Yes, grass. The herb yielding seed and the and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so. And then later in Genesis 1 we read that all of these things were given to the man to be meat. And we're reading right through the scriptures. We're reading right through the scriptures that the man worshipped the creation rather than the creator. And this is the direction I'm going in at the moment. This is the direction that the Holy Spirit's leading me in. I could just do a video on all this now, but I've got to stay on track. So we, we get to this word mail in this video. But, but just that then led me to, to, to a couple of scriptures. So Genesis 1.29, the one I was just re referencing. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed 
which is upon the face of the earth and every tree which is in the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and it was in revelation 9 4 it was commanded by them that they should not hurt these are the creatures the locusts coming out of the bottomless pit and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any green tree but only those men which did not have the seal of god on their forehead so these words but only right these words but only those men which did not have the seal of god on their forehead so this is telling me that these things before this semicolon are the people who have the seal of god so they are the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree and in Genesis 1.29, we're reading that those things will be meat for the man. So just who, oh who, oh who, is the man? What is a man? And this is what I'm going to get to at some point on this video, just about this intervention from the Holy Spirit. And I think we may have a bit of a clue about that scripture in Galatians where Paul says he's as a woman in travail. I think I've just read something in Jeremiah about that as well. Now, this then led me to the, 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 the cherubim. So these two scriptures I've shared a couple of times that I think a lot of, of people seriously seeking truth in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be familiar with these two scriptures. Ezekiel 1.10 and Ezekiel 10.14. And I've color-coded all the things here the faces of the living creature that Ezekiel saw. So we see in gold, man, and we see in pink, lion, and we see in green, eagle, and in blue, the ox changed to a cherub, right? So back in Psalms 106.20, they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. And in the two scriptures in Ezekiel, we can see that this ox changed into a cherub. And then that just leads me back to the anointed cherub that covereth in Ezekiel 28. He was the anointed cherub that covereth and the woman was created to be a help meet for the man. And that word help means a shield, a covering. So what is a man? What is a woman indeed? And I think we're going to learn more about that on this video as we plow our way through. So as I say, this video is going to be about, I'm going to start this video about this, but I just want to talk about a couple of other things first, of course, uh, as I already have. And I just want to take you to Revelation 12 in a sec. But this video is going to be about that, this word here, uh, H2145. It, that we read in first in Genesis 1 20, 27. Because remember, we've got to keep centered here that the man was created in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female. So the man is plural. It's at least two beings, one male, one female. And we read that again in, in Genesis 5 where he called their name Adam. And so God, who's a plural, the Elohim, created the man, which is a plural, in his own image. And back in Psalms, of course, we read that they change their glory. So the Im image of God, maybe, the, the image of God, is this where it happened? Was this, the, was this some kind of fall? Was the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden mirrored somehow in the, in the, in the story of the children of Israel going into the land of Canaan. I know we've got timelines and it's a different time and it's well after in terms of time, but there's scripture after scripture that tells me that it's just at the very least, it's a very, very similar event because we see here they change their glory. Now, is man in a glorious state today? Would you say that? No, I wouldn't, but here we're seeing that they change their glory into a similitude of an ox and in genesis 1 27 the man was created in god's image so that's a glorious state isn't isn't it male and female he created he them so that's what this video is going to be about when we get there so when i was researching this this word man child right so th this is where we're going to go on this video this word man child one of the ways it's translated, this word male, is it's, cre it's translated out to man-child. And I'm sure those, those of you who regularly read the Bible will have come into this word man-child and probably wondered, what, what, what's the difference between a, 
just a normal child and a man child. What is it? And I think this might well be it. It's a male of the male and female created he then. But we'll get there in a sec because it's taken me back to Revelation 12 yet again. Now, there's a few things in Revelation 12 that I just keep coming back here, right? I keep coming back here. So we've got, first of all, we've got this travailing in birth. And I've seen this a few times in Jeremiah. And I feel as though the Holy Spirit's just getting me, getting me closer and closer to the truth with this, just with this travailing in birth, exactly what it means. Because remember, Paul said he's as a woman at travails till Christ be formed in us. I know all of this is leading me closer to Jesus and it's leading me closer to the gospel, which I just glorify the Lord for, because that's where the truth is. But that's where the truth is. The truth is in Jesus. The truth is in the gospel. But I was created and part of my calling is to know as much as I possibly can about creation, about the Old Testament, and he's leading me to the gospel that way. And it's a beautiful, glorious thing. He's he's leading me to the gospel by leading me to ask the questions that I want to ask. And he's answering those those questions just in the scriptures and also just in these just these most profound interventions that he's that he's giving me. Just like that last video from that person shines, just like that profile shines, and it just happens to me every day. People will say something, I'm like, what was that? That was the Holy Spirit, you know? And it just happens time and time again. And this scripture here in Revelation 12, 4, this takes me back to Zechariah, Zechariah 13, 9, where he's going to bring a third part through the fire and he's going to refine them like silver and gold. So we've got a third part of the stars of heaven being cast out. And I believe Zechariah, well, the scriptures are leading me to think that Zechariah 13, 9, that's, that's about the third part that perhaps is going to replace these third part of the stars of heaven that got kicked out, the source of light, right? So these, part, these third part of the stars of heaven were the source of light that we read in Genesis 1, where there was darkness upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and, and, and God said, let there be light. And the source of that light were the lights in the firmament, the stars. And now a third part of them are going to get cast out. And, and, and Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that we are lights upon a hill and we're, light, we're lights on the earth. And, and Philippians, the script, that scripture in Philippians that I've shared a few times, that the sons of God, that we, we, we without murmuring in a, in a, in a crooked and perverse generation that we shine that we shine i can't think of the scripture offhand but i'll put it up on the screen but again it's about us being lights on the earth in the flesh so so that, that to me it all it's all connecting up revelation 12 for me is just is just incredible and this woman just this just 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 this just this woman in revelation 12 12 1 this woman boy oh boy more on that in a sec right so this also takes me to Genesis 37, 9 and 10. And I went through this in my last video, but I'll just quickly go over it again. Because we've got, in, in Revelation 37, we've got the sun. So we're, I'll, I'll read the scriptures first. So, and, and he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars paid, made obstinance to me. Right? And then verse 10, Jacob's reaction was his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, Jacob, the son, thy mother, Rachel, the moon, thy brethren, the eleven brothers, the eleven stars, indeed come to? Come to. So to come to, you've got to come from somewhere else, right? Bow down ourselves to the, to the earth. So who are these people? Who exactly are these people? So again, we've got Jacob, I, Jacob, the son, mother, Rachel, moon, Rachel, thy brethren, the eleven brothers, the eleven stars, indeed to come to bow ourselves to thee to the earth. And there appeared a, a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, Jacob, sun, moon, Rachel, moon, and twelve stars, thy brethren, this says eleven, but is it reasonable to think if the other 11 brothers had a star that Joseph also had a star? Scriptures are absolutely leading me to think so. So as you can see, Revelation 12 for me is just absolutely chock-a-block. It is absolutely 
packed full of goodness. So as I was re- as I was researching this and having a bit of a look into it, I came into this scripture down at the bottom, Revelation twelve thirteen. The dragon was wroth with the woman. So who's this woman? Anyone know who this woman is? I haven't colour coded it because I haven't been able to make the link yet as to whether this is H eight zero two. Because remember, in the New Testament we've got G numbers. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. See that? Her seed. Now, I've had a bit of a look at this word seed, and I'll get to this in a sec as well on this video, but it's the same Greek word as Jesus was using in his parable. But her seed. So remember in Genesis 4.25 that Eve said that God has appointed me another seed. Another seed when she, when she, when she bears Seth. So, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, this this is telling me that the seed of this woman that we read about in Revelation 12 is the seed of them which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, this is telling me that those in the body of Christ, because we're doing that, aren't we? We're, we're witnesses for the truth. We're witnesses for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, we're, and we do our darn best every day to keep the commandments of God. And if we fail, we go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in his body, the body of Christ. And those people are her seed. So who now is this woman? Who now is this woman? Because we can see that her seed is those who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, who is this woman of whom seed will be keeping the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ and will be having a dragon making war with them? So on my previous reads of the New Testament, I've read Revelation now about three, four times, I think. I've never noticed this word seed. I've never noticed this word seed in Revelation 12, 17 at all. Revelation 12 has always got my attention because I just feel at times it's telling the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in, 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 in a way, but in other ways it's not. But I'll get to that when I return to the whole man-child word. So straight away when I was led back to this yesterday, when I was researching this video, I was reminded of the great mystery. Now, the great mystery with what I can see, the Ephesians 5 great mystery that I've been talking about in this video that we will talk about in a bit more detail as we go forward. I've seen it three times in the scriptures. I've seen it in Genesis 2, Matthew 19 and Ephesians 5. And each one of them have what I call a companion verse. So if we compare the scriptures here, Genesis 2, 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So there's four words here that are the same. We've got man and wife. We've got father and mother. They appear in all four, and the word flesh appears in all four as, as well. And this word cleave, twain, and joined. And when you have a look at them, they basically say the same thing. Matthew 19, 5, and he said, for this cause, shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. In Ephesians 5, 31, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So what I thought I'd do, I thought this gives me really good opportunity to bring this H802 from the Old Testament, this word here, wife, to the New Testament, because it's basically the same scripture, is it not? So would, I don't think it would be a leap to start thinking, well, this word here probably means the same as that word there in the Old Testament. So whatever G number this is, it probably corresponds to this H number here. Now, there are probably some people going, oh, you can't make leaps like that, and that, that's probably true, but I'm, I'm going to go forward with it 
at the moment because that's where the scriptures are leading me and there could be others out there saying well you know that's what it says but if you're in that camp you wait till we get this word man it gets really really complicated this word man when you try and try and compare new and old testament so we have a look at the greek word and it's g double one three five and it, it's woman of any age whether a virgin or married or a widow a wife of a betrothed woman. And the Greek lexicon offers some very interesting scriptures indeed. And I'm going to return to that. And we can see the scriptures where the word appears here. So when we're talking about Mary and the birth of Jesus and all these scriptures here in the New Testament, this is where we see this word woman. And it also translates out to wife, just like the, the Old Testament. So it feels to me like it's the same word. It's describing the same thing. And we see here in the later books of the New Testament where it's used, and we can see here that it's used in Ephesians in the great mystery I'm talking about. There's the scripture I'm talking about. Ephesians 5.31. And then we come down into Revelation 12.17. And there it is again. So... This, this, it's the same word. Now, I'm not saying this woman is is Eve or anything like that, but I'm saying it's the same. It's the same word. So as we now try and compare the great mystery, we get a. We've just got a bit bit of a grounding going on here where we can make a start on this. Okay, so in Genesis two, we read in the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So this is Adam talking about what the Lord God had done in verse 22. And the Lord God, as I say before, the Lord God said he'd taken the rib from the man and he brought her unto the man. And Adam says as a result of that, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And this is the first time we see this H376 word. So when we have a look at Ephesians 5, we'll pick it up to, we'll pick it up at verse 23, I think, just to give it the most context. She might not have been in Ephesians for a while. It's, it's most interesting indeed, this, this great mystery. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So, just let's have a look at this, right? So even as Christ is at the head of the church, so Christ is the husband and the church is the wife. That's how I read that. And it just sort of, that scripture, I can't think of what chapter it was, but the scripture in Matthew about the about the virgins and about, about the ten virgins and also about the wedding. Also about the wedding. And he also talks to people about, fasting and jesus said unto them can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them then he shall fast so we see now that we've we've got jesus referring to himself as the bridegroom again so he's he's the husband which it's 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 a common language you see it a few times in the new testament so for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I just want to reiterate what I said in those videos that I did about just the sexual deception and the deception that's going on today in the Bible, is that the, the, the scriptures aren't telling me that this... And that are people who have gone down to their local church and had a had a ceremony in front of a Masonic pastor and signed a Masonic piece of paper that was brought into law by Masonic lawyers and Masonic politicians. It's something far, far more profound than that. And it comes into this great mystery that I'm talking about here. So I just invite you just to try to get your head out of that mindset, because remember, this word is is in the book, which is what it is. So this word here contained in this book is what this word actually means not what we see today on the tv and in your newspapers and everything that's run by the freemasonic world that we live in so therefore as the church and even this word it's not it's not people going and singing songs on a sunday morning in a masonic church headed up by a masonic pastor no 
No, it's 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 the body of Christ. It's those people who are truly, truly following the Lord Jesus Christ, which the scriptures are leading me to think that it's the bride and, and, and it's the woman. And I'll keep going and I'll explain why I say that. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives to be their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Even as Christ also loved he, loved the church, even as the husband loved the wife and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, remember when I do that, husband and wife, it's because it's saying it here. So the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So when I do that, that's where I'm getting it from. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I'm not preaching a doctrine. I'm showing people what the Holy Spirit's showing me and that what the scriptures are showing me is he teaches me how to read these scriptures. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Starts, starts to make me think now about the Levitical books, all this without blemish language that we hear because we heard a lot about that in, in Leviticus, that you bring the lamb to the altar and it be without blemish and a year old and the like. It just, it really reminds me like that, reminds me of that, even this verse here, sanctified and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. It just it sounds very, very Old Testament Leviticus to me. So ought, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So who's he talking to? Who's, who's Paul talking to here? Because we're not talking about people sitting in a church that have had a Masonic ceremony in front of a Masonic pastor. It's, it all comes back to what's a woman, what's a man, and Genesis 2 and this great mystery, and exactly what it all means. What's a, what's a husband? What's a wife? For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So this is telling us for the man to love the wife, the woman, even as God, the Lord. I assume it's Jesus. I assume it's still Jesus, the church. As the husband loved the wife. So as the Lord loves, has the husband, loves the wife, for no man, husband, has ever hated his own flesh. The woman, right? The woman. Because the church, the church is the wife and the flesh. So we've got the wife, we've got the church, and we've got the church, and we've got the flesh. So the man, each time, is playing the role of the husband and Jesus. And remember, Adam and Jesus were both the son of God. Because who, who are these people? Because he's really comparing them here. I, I'm, I'm reading, he's comparing them here to Adam and to Jesus. For, for no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones for this cause. So this is the same scripture we read in Genesis 2 where the Lord brings the brings the woman to the man. For this cause, so for this thing, shall a man leave his father and his mother? What's a father? What's a mother? Everything's open for discussion. And shall be joined to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. What does that mean? This is the companion verse, right? This is the verse that we read in Genesis 2, Matthew 19, 5, and Ephesians 5, 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. So it's huge. This scripture is absolutely pivotal in trying to work out what's going on here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. How do two beings become one flesh? Yes, Paul, it is indeed a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church, the husband and the wife, and the wife to me is also telling us that it's flesh. And Paul is telling the men 
to love their wives as their own bodies as I don't know. They, sh they should. Sh they, they too shall be one. One flesh. Love their wives as their own bodies. So the wife is the church and the flesh, and the man is the husband and Jesus. For yet no man ever hated his own flesh. So Jesus never hated his own church even as the Lord, the church. So it's leading me to think here that the woman is the flesh and the church and the man, well, the man is the husband. And what is the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ, is he not the Holy Spirit? Okay, so let's bring a few scriptures together so I can articulate just what I'm saying here and what I have been saying for a while. So in Genesis 2.22, And the rib which the Lord had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So how is this possible? How do two beings become one flesh, right? Now, when we come into Leviticus 18, the scriptures are leading me to think that when the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. He is talking to spirits. He is talking to the spirits of the children of Israel at, about their fellow, about their about them them in the flesh. And we see this here, the nakedness of thy father. And remember in Genesis 2, we've got them leaving. We've got them leaving their father and their mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife. And who do we cleave to? We cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So something's changed after the sin of the Garden of Eden. Now, when we come down into these scriptures about these ones where it's where they reckon it's about having a bit of an afternoon sojourn with the missus next door, no, it's it's more it's more profound than that because if it's about sex, right? So let's say it's about having a bit of a a bit of a roll in the hay with your with the missus next door on a Saturday afternoon. How else would you do that, but carnally? Right, so he's talking to the spirits. You won't go in carnally to your neighbour, your fellow, you in the flesh, their wife, to defile thyself with her. So what's a wife, right? So this is the things we, we want to find out. And they shall not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. So this, this is the result of that. So if you do this, that's the result of it. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It, it is an abomination. And then... To me, this, this, this scripture in verse 23, this is talking about Babel because Babel means confusion by mixing. So when we now have a look at Leviticus 19, 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of my people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as, see that, as thyself. So you love thy neighbour as yourself. So does anybody here love your next door neighbour as much as you love yourself? Is that a fair request from the Lord, you think? You think the Lord would want you to do that? Or do you think he's talking about the spirit loving the flesh as much as the spirit loves the spirit? And potentially vice versa. That's where the, that's where the scriptures are leading me at the moment. Yes, brave. I've got to be brave in the name of truth, brave in the, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll continue to do that. Now, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. So this is when Jesus is giving the two great commandments, right? And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbour, here we go again with as thyself, right? So it's the same command as what was just read in Leviticus, thou, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So in Matthew 29, thou shalt love thy neighbour as as thyself. So is it is it is Jesus talking now? Is Jesus talking about your next door neighbor or is he talking about spirit and flesh, right? Now Ephesians 5, we come back into that now and we see in verse 29 so ought men to love their wives as they own as 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 their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It kind of makes sense. 
For, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it even as the Lord, the church. So the, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit and he loves, he loves the flesh as much as he loves himself, the flesh, the church, people that follow him in the flesh. Just where the scriptures are leading me, guys. And then we come into Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, spirits, children of Israel. I'm not there yet, but there's lots of scripture there that I've been putting down lately that perhaps the sons of God could well be the children of Israel. Spiritual beings, though, right? Went into the daughters of men fleshly beings that they were fair and they took the wives of which they chose so here we've got spirits going into women so is this husbands going into wives is this the spirit not loving the flesh is this the sin is this passing your children through the fire to Molech and the Lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man so he also right he also is flesh so if he's also flesh that means he's something else as well isn't he that means he's something else as well. For me, right now, all of these things, all of these things are connected and I just feel like I'm getting confirmation after confirmation. Now, let's return to that word widow in the New Testament. So the Greek lexicon offers us some scriptures that takes us into some very interesting directions indeed. So we've got three Old Testament scriptures here. And it seems to be relating to a new because they're in brackets. So I thought I'd have a look at that. These are the scriptures here. We've got 1 Kings 7, 2 and 14, 1 Kings 17, 9 and Luke 4, 26. Now, 1 Kings 7, 2, I can't see anything that's got to do with a woman. But have a look what it's talking about. We'll get to that in a sec. It's talking about this house. Boy, oh boy. And look at the next one. We're straight into Tyre. And then the one under, we're into Zidon. See, but we see the common thing here. We've got a widow. We've got a widow here. And we've got a widow here. So that seems to be the word it's talking about in the Greek lexicon here. Because we've got a woman of any age, whether a virgin, married, or a widow. And whenever I see the child e lexicon or the greek lexicon offer scripture from the from the the other testament if we're in the new it offers from the old and vice versa i take notice because it really gives you an opportunity to really get into some some decent bible study and and look at the prophecies and and how they actually come to pass and you really i'm finding i'm growing in the scriptures big time by doing that and Everything just leads back to Jesus, right? And, the, and they change the symbol to, they change the, the glory of their, or to an ox, and, and it's leading me closer to the, to the gospel of Jesus, I mentioned earlier, right? So the word in the scripture in Luke that it offers, widow, G5503, we see that it basically translates out to widow each time. 27 times it appears in the New Testament. And each time it's this word, widow. But in the Old Testament, check where it immediately takes us to. It takes us to the adventures of Judah in, in Genesis 38. Now, this is when Judah went down. He went down from his brethren, right? He came to pass. He went down from his brethren and it turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Harah. And Judah saw there the daughter of a certain, a certain, right? What's that mean? A certain Canaanite whose name was Shuar and he took her and went into her now as far as I know going into Canaanites was a big sin of the children of Israel now she conceived a bear the son and called Ur and she conceived again and bare another son and called his name Onan now Ur was evil in the sight of the Lord and and the Lord slew him and this is where we see Judah say to the other son, go into thy brother's wife. So Ur, the firstborn, this Tamar, go into her so you can raise up seed. But this Onan, this is where we see the seed spilling on the ground, right? And Onan knew that, what, that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground. 
lest he should give seed to his brother. So his, his seed, his seed spilling on the ground. And the thing he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore he slew him also. So this Tamar is out of luck, big time. And this is where we see the word widow that we're talking about. When we hear Judah say to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house to Salah, my son be grown. For he said, lest per perventure he die also, and his brethren did. And Tamar dwelt in his father's house. And basically what happened was that Judah didn't hold up in his end of the bargain. And, this, and she put off her wid widow's garments and she played the harlot. And I don't know what all this means, but I don't know whether this is talking about maybe DNA or something like that, because this is where she said, what pledge would you give me? And she said, give me thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff, which is in thine hand. And he gave it to her and came into her and she conceived by him. And she rose and went away and laid it by her veil from her and she put on back on the garments of a widow, widowhood. Now Ju Judah sent a kid to go and look for her, but he returned and he said he couldn't find her. And Judah said, let, let her take it to her lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid and she can't find her. And about three months later, Judah found out that she played the harlot and that she was with child by whoredom. Now, Judah wasn't happy about this, and he said that let her be burned. He, he was going to slew her. And when she was brought forth, she sent her to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, who are these, thy sickness, bracelets, and stars. So this is, you know, she, she's saying, well, hang on, I, this, this actually happened with Judah. He's, I've got his, is it his DNA? I, I, I don't know. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. And Judah acknowledged him and said, she hath been more righteous than I because I, that I gave her not to Shalah my son. So he didn't ha hold up his end of the bargain. So this is, remember, this is the widow of, of Judah's first son who the Lord saw was evil and, and he slew and he knew her again no more. And this is where she, she come to travail, right? Travail, here we go. And there were twins in her womb and this is the scarlet thread. This is the scarlet thread that goes down all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's something extra significant going on with this scarlet thread that I can't quite grasp. So the scriptures are telling us that the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first. Now, before the first one that came out, so the first one that should have come out was the Ra. But it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth this breach? This word breach, right? This breach be upon thee. It just reminds me of that story, the Ark of the Covenant, where... In Second Samuel 6. Now, this is the scripture after, the chapter after, where we hear again about Haram, king of Tyre furnishing the house of David with cedar trees, carpenters, masons. And, and this is where I've, I've shared this recently on a video, this scriptures. This is where David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he exalted his kingdom for his people's Israel's sake. Now, what's this, what's this perception? Where's this perception coming from? Is this... Is this coming from because Haram, king of Tyre, sent messages to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons and they built David a house? The king of Tyre being the, being the, the anointed cherubim that covereth? I, I, I'm not sure, but because after that, David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem, didn't he? And, and the Lord of hosts was with David. The Lord of hosts was with David. So the, the, the sin seems to be for Solomon that Solomon took on many strange women. But it seems it was fine for David for him to take on more concubines and wives because they come out of Jerusalem. So what's the difference between a Jerusalem woman and a strange woman that Solomon did? Because the, the sin of Solomon was so, so profound, so, so deep and so intense where David only sinned once. And that was in the matter of the wife, the wife of the... Oh, I'm not, sure of this. I'm not sure of the scripture. We could just keep going down into more trails here, but there, there was only one sin. I'll put it up on the screen that where, where David saw the lady, she was, 
she was sunbaking or something of the like and, and David killed the husband. But in any case, I've got to stay on track. So David was basically a perfect man apart from this sin. But Solomon's sin were very intense and the difference was Solomon loved many strange women but David took many more concubines and wives but they were out of Jerusalem. But in any case, after this scripture, this is where we see this story where they're, where they're singing and they're joyful and they're really resembling again the sons of God in, in, that we read in Job 38 and in Ezra 3 where they lay on the foundations of the house and they lay on the foundations of the earth and here they're they're laying the foundation of the new Jerusalem with this Ark of the Covenant. It's a very, very happy time. But this is that story. <laughs> and David and all the house of Israel play before the Lord on all manner of instruments, and made of fir wood, even of harps, and of holsteries, and of timbrels, and of corners, and of cymbals. And when they came to Nash on the threshing floor, Uzziah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took it and hold of it. Now get this. For the oxen. Yes. Yes, the oxen, that's right, the oxen shook it. Here we go again with the oxen, right? For the anger of the Lord was kindled against his eye, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach. The Lord had made a breach upon Uzziah, and he called the name of that place for Zuyah for this day. Here we go with this breach, for the oxen shook it, and they change their similitude, they change their glory into that, the similitude of an ox, as we read in Psalms 106, 19, 20, when they made that calf in, 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 in Hamar. So is, is there a connection here? I, I, I'm not sure. In any case, this word breach be upon thee, therefore his name was Fahiz. Now this is the scarlet thread, but this is the one that should have come out first that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was Zerah because when we come into the lineage in Matthew 1 we can see that Judah begat Fahiz and Zerah and then the lineage goes from Fahiz so Fahiz goes all the way down to the story of, of, of the, the story of Ruth and Salmon for memory Salmon is the story of, of, of Rahab in Joshua but this goes all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the lineage is Fahiz. So when we return back to Genesis 38, we can see that Fahiz was the one who came out first, that Zerah had the scarlet thread upon his hand. And Fahiz was the one where the midwife described or asked the question, how has they broken, broken forth? this breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was Fahiz. Now there's also something significant going on with the lineage and, and just the sins of Solomon is just far more significant than what I thought and I'm starting to think a lot of the Old Testament is all about Solomon and his wisdom and his decline and his sins and, and loving his strange women. I just keep coming back to him and the, just the similarities between him and the and the king of Tyre, but I'm not ready to put them down yet because I can't quite gather my thoughts on that. But we read in Matthew 1 that the lineage goes from Jesse to David and then to Solomon, right? And then it goes all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we come into Luke 3, we also get a lineage. Now, something that I noticed on my last read through of the New Testament is that this lineage there's a point of difference. Something's different. Something changes, right? And it, it, this is significant. I, I, I don't, I, has it got something to do with the virgin birth? I just, I can't help to think that it has because it is different. Now, we start getting a lineage in verse 23, 24. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. Now, I, 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 what, what, what's that mean? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But as, as, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And we, we all know that Jesus was the son of God. And so in Luke 3.38, so was Adam, right? So it, start, it starts at Adam and it finishes in Jesus and they're both the son of God. But 
as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And then we start getting a lineage that goes down, but it goes in the other direction in Luke. So in, in, in Genesis, it goes from the, from, from the oldest to, to, the, to the most recent. And in, and in Luke, it goes all the way down. It starts at Jesus and it goes all the way down, all the way down to Adam. So it's a lot more thorough the one in Luke. But in any case, when we come into, into David, something significant happens. So we'll go the other way. So we see we've got Boaz, we've got Salmon, and we've got Jesse, and then we've got David, right? But it changes. So we've got the lineage goes from David to Nathan, which is another one of his sons, the son of David. David had many sons because he had many wives. And another one of his sons was this guy, Nathan. And then from there, it seems that the lineage, it goes all the way up to Jesus. So if you think about it in today's terms, so if you've got a brother and the, the lineage of you and your brother, they're not going to be the same. They're, they're not going to beget the same people, are they? But it goes all the way up to Joseph, this lineage. It goes to Joseph as does the one in Matthew. And the lineage in Matthew is the lineage that I always just understood it to be. You know? It goes from David and it, and it goes up to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we can see that it's the kings. When we have a look at the lineage here, it's basically the kings. We start, we go from David and these are all the kings, right? So we've got Solomon and Rehoboam and RBI and ASA and Josaphat and the, the language is a bit different in the New Testament but, but they're the same people right they're the kings and then it brings me to this one this is the one where I spoke of the other day in a video one of my previous videos I spoke about this story in this story in Jeremiah I'll just get to in a sec but in the lineage in Luke 3 something really interesting emerges so we go from in Matthew it goes from being Solomon to Nathan, right? Now, when we have a look at this word, Nathan, his name is means a giver, Nathan, a giver. Now, he was one of the four sons of David who were born to him by Bathsheba. So I thought I'd have a look at this word, Bathsheba. And Bathsheba means daughter of wealth. The wife of Uriah, who David had murdered, having, having had adulterous relations with her, subsequently wife of David and mother of Solomon. Right? So this is the woman, because the, that story I was talking about before, where the, the matter of Uriah, that's, that, that woman that David went into and had the son, and, and, the, and, and the Lord slew the son, she had another son when David was comforting her after the death of that son, and the, and that son was <laughs> that son was was Solomon. So this Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon and the wife of Uriah, and the the one point of the one sin that I was just talking about. So, my goodness gracious me, talk about learning while you do these videos, man. This is this is just incredible. But she was the mother of both Nathan and of Solomon. But she was also the wife of Judah. Now, these are the th I didn't know this, right? I didn't know this before I started this video. I knew none of this. But she was also the wife of Judah that we just read about in the Scarlet Thread story. So we see in 1 Chronicles 2, 3, another lineage, and the sons of Judah, Ur, and On, and Salah, which three were born unto him, the daughter of Shua. Now, this is the woman in Genesis 38 that Judah went into. Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. This is who we're talking about. Now, this is a sin, isn't it? This is a sin when, because he's gone down from his brethren, hasn't he? He's gone down from his brethren and he saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite. So that's mixing yourself with the, with the daughters of the lamb, which is a big sin. It's a big no-no. But this is, the, this is the woman that we're talking about, and this is how the whole Scarlet Thread began. Now, I'm not quite sure why, but we've got different H numbers, but it's definitely the same person, because in, in G Genesis 38, it describes the same story is what we're 
as what we're seeing here in First Chronicles. She's, it's the same name as Solomon's and Nathan's mother. So this is this is most significant what's happening here because this is the point of difference. Nathan and Solomon is the point of difference in the lineages of Matthew 1 and Luke 3. So this just now, as I say, this reminds me of the story that we that I shared pre, in a previous video in Jeremiah 22 in verse 28. So this is where the Lord changes the name of the king to Kenea. Is this man Kenea a despised broken oil? And is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Therefore they are cast out he and his seed. Right? So he and his seed are cast out. So this is the seed of Solomon. They're cast out. So th th that that means that the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ isn't these. The seed, right? The seed. The seed. Is there something about is something going on about the seed, maybe? Is that the difference between Luke and Matthew? Because the seed, because the seed in Matthew, the lineage in Matthew is the seed of the kings, is this seed here. So the lineage in Matthew is the lineage that we read here. This, But, but this man's seed, which is the seed of Solomon, which is the lineage in Matthew, are cast out and they're going to be childless. Write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his day, for no man of his seed, right? No man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So then that reminds me of this word branch and root and the like. So Jeremiah 23, we continue on. Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, right? Saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful, right? They shall be fruitful, and they shall increase. Genesis 1. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth right so this this is the lord jesus christ in his days judah shall be saved and israel shall dwell safely and this is his name whereby he shall be called the lord our righteousness but therefore behold the days come saith the lord that they shall no more say the lord liveth which brought us forth up the children out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought us up and led the seed. See that? Led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them. And they shall dwell in their own land, which brought up the seed of the house of Israel, right? So then we come into Isaiah 11. I remember this one as well, but Isaiah 11, 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, right? A rod out of the stem of Jesse and, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And I just wonder whether this word rod is the same as the Hebrew word. I'll pop it up on the screen as Skeeter that I mentioned there the other day. That word Skeeter and then tribe and... Just the, the, that that word rod can sometimes interpret out and it can translate out to skeeter and and tribe the same word as twelve tribes. And in verse ten, check this out. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, and sh and it shall the, the shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Here we go with these Gentiles. Now. Now, how are these Gentiles come into it? What's Jew? What's a Gentile, right? Everything in this house is up for discussion because we don't know what these things are. Now, the story of Joshua and Jesus, I've done videos on this previously. 
where the connections between Joshua and Jesus are numerous and just undeniable. They both mean Jehovah is salvation for one. And Joshua and Caleb were only two that survived when uh, the, the, that, the generation of the children of Israel that wandered in the wilderness because they escaped out the land of Canaan for 40 days. Yes, 40 days they escaped out the land of Canaan and they were the only two who came back with a report that the land was, was both good and you can, yes, we can smoke the inhabitants of the land because we've got the Lord with us, right? So the, the Lord smote everybody else because they complained and, and they hearkened to the voice of the other ten who came back with a, bad, with a good report of the land but a bad report of the people. They're, they're too big for us, right? And they can't and we can't smoke them, we can't take them. But, but the, 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 how long was the Lord Jesus Christ in, in the wilderness and tempted of Satan for? Yeah, 40 days, right? So now this story here, Joshua 10, I've come to this quite a few times, but this add on Chesonisek, if you take in the book of Jasher, there's parallels with him with Mel, Melchizedek, right? And there's, there's parallels anyway, because he looks like he was a Canaanite king to me. He was a Canaanite king of Jerusalem because this is before David took Jerusalem and Jerusalem was in the land of Canaan and this Adon Tezanisak he was the king of it and the story goes they made, made a league a league of nations to go to war against the children of Israel because they, they heard of all the all the smoting and all the all the winning of the wars that the children of Israel were doing and they were and they were afraid of what was going to happen. It happened to them, so they made a league. And, and Joshua, of course, had the Lord, and, and he smote them. But Joshua here, he hung them on, each, on a tree, didn't he? So Joshua smote them and slew them, and he hanged them on five trees, and they were hanging upon the trees. Now, when we come into Galatians, this is the curse. So Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is for it is written, "Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree." So we've got Christ redeeming us from the curse of the law, being a made made a curse for us, for it is written, "Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree." So Christ has redeemed us from the very curse that Joshua was executing to the Canaanites in the land of Jerusalem, and they both mean. Jehovah is salvation, right? So there's, par there's massive parallels going on between Joshua and Jesus. Now this, this just takes me to Zechariah 3, which to me is absolutely loaded. And I'm going to read the whole scripture. It's only 10 verses. Zechariah 3, 1. And he showed me Joshua, right? Joshua. Here we go. It's a different person. It's the same name, same Hebrew word. The high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing on his right hand to resist him. Now, who sits on the right hand of God? Are they connected? Is anything a coincidence in the Bible? So we've got Satan standing on the right hand of Joshua. So, they're, they're, and, and, and Jesus sits on the right hand of God. And Joshua and Jesus both mean Jehovah is salvation. Are they connected? They just have to be. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. All right. So it sounds though like he's come fresh in from the land of Canaan, the children of Israel, when they was at the, their sinning was at their height. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said unto, and he, unto him, he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. And there, and they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, right? So we've got the Lord of hosts now. So this is the Lord of all the spirits, the Lord of all the spiritual armies. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and they will keep my charge, then thou shalt judge my house, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee the places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, right? 
right, right, the high priest, the high priest. Is this after the order of Melchizedek? I'm just a fever pitch, guys. So Joshua, Joshua, the high priest, and Melchizedek, and Adotizedek, and it was the king of Jerusalem in Joshua 10. You see where I am? Thou and thy fellows, right? Thou and thy fellows, we're speaking of the whole of the host, we're in the spiritual, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And it's in capitals. Branch, branch is in capitals, and I will bring forth a branch out of the root of Jesse, right? For behold, the stone, <laughs> the stone I've laid before Joshua, Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the, engra the engraving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Now, get your ears around this lot. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, right? The Lord of the spirits, the Lord of the spiritual armies, shall you carry every man his neighbour, his neighbour, under the vine and under the fig tree. So I, I, I don't quite know what I'm dealing with here, but I know I'm dealing with something that is absolutely enormous. Because when we now return to Matthew 1, we've got, it starts the lineage we've got, we've got the, the, the lineage starts at Abraham, right? So the lineage goes from Abraham and it comes to David the king and then it goes from David to Solomon and it comes up to, and Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus, who is the Christ. And then in Luke 3, we've got Abraham, and we come to David, and we go from Solomon to Nathan, and we've got all of these different people here. We go from the kings in Matthew 1 to all of these different people here, names that I've never heard of. And then we come up, to Jesus be, himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. So we've got to have that, this as was supposed in brackets here. What does that mean? Is this connected? I really think it is. The scriptures are leading me to think that it could well be. As supposed, the son of Joseph. So we go from, we go from Abraham to David, exactly the same in both. But we go from David to Nathan, and in Matthew 1, we go from David to Solomon. But from David, we go to Joseph, as was supposed. And in Matthew 1, we go from Abraham to David to Solomon, all the way to Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus who is the Christ. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So on the left, I've got the lineage in Matthew and on the right, I've got the lineage in Luke. So don't forget in the, in the lineage of Matthew, it goes from Abraham down to Jesus and in Luke, it goes from Jesus down to Adam. So I thought I'd come in and have a bit of a closer look at it. And the names are definitely different. So you've got Christ, Joseph, Jacob in Matthew and in Luke, we've got Jesus and we've got Joseph and then Hilly and this is the first point of difference we go from Joseph to Hilly to Matat and in Matthew we go from Joseph to Jacob to Matham so I thought I'd have a look at just these names in Blue Letter Bible so the, a closer look at this word Jacob and check this out it's Jacob heel catcher or supplanter so that's exactly what Jacob means in the Old Testament so that's who this is referring to was the second son of Isaac, and then it says it was also the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. So it's the same person. It's the same person. It's, it's actually Jacob. And, and we see at the top of the lineage, and Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judas and his brethren. And we come down to the scripture we're talking about in Matthew 1.16. It's exactly the same G number because it's saying it's the same, it's the same being, same same words, same meaning, same, same everything. So the, for me, this is just fascinating stuff. And then in Luke, we go from Joseph down into Heli. And Heli means ascending, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And we only see it in the scriptures the one time. 
Now, this one's quite fascinating because it also means gift of God. And this is the scripture we're talking about here in Luke 3, 23 and 24. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Matat. And this Matat, it means gift of God and Matam means gift they're very similar sounding names but they're definitely different people different g numbers it only appears the once in the scriptures does this does this matan but matat it it appears twice it comes up in luke 3 24 but then it also shows up in luke 3 29 and i'm noticing a, a couple of interesting things here with the luke with the luke lineage We've got words like Levi and Simeon and Judah and Joseph, and we've got all of these names of the 12 tribes of Israel. I don't know, guys. I really, really don't know what's happening here. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is revealing to me now. Oh, Lord God of Israel, what, oh, what are you instilling on this humble vessel of the Lord right now? I don't know, but... It's all very, very exciting. There's something in this. I just keep coming back to the same things. And, and I just, right now, I'm a little bit confused, but we keep treading out this corn. And I'm most, most excited because I feel as though there's just something being revealed to me here, something really, really big. And, well, all glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, man. Now, one of the scriptures in the Old Testament where we see this word widow, and remember that the Greek lexicons take it as here just by looking at that word woman, the, the, the description of the word woman in the Greek lexicon. That's how we've got here. One of them is this story where Elijah, Elijah is, is with the ravens and there was, there, was a, there was a famine in the land and the ravens fed Elijah by the brook. Now, this is this is the scripture here. Arise and get thee the Lord come unto Elijah, saying, Get to get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, right? The Zidon, the Zidonians, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So Elijah arises and he comes to Zarephath, and he comes to the gate, the gate, right, the gate of the city. Behold, the widow woman. Now, this is the, I gather she's a Zazonian, and she's a widow, and she was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little, ves little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread. Now, the impression I'm getting here that she's quite poor, because she says, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I might go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, Elijah tells her not to fear and says, make me a little cake first and bring it to me and after make for thee and thy son. For thus, he, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord, the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did all according to what Elijah said, and she did eat many days. So the prophecy of the Lord was fulfilled by the word of Elijah. We read that in verse 16. Now after these things, the son of the woman he fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What I have to do with thee, O thou man of God, out thou come into me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son. So I wonder what the sin is. I wonder what this widow woman from, the, from Zidon, I wonder what her sin is. So far I can see that she's poor. And that seems to be manifest, manifesting in, in that she's gathering two sticks. And she's saying that he, he, she, she, hasn't, she, hasn't, she can't make Elijah a little cake first. She can't do it because she hasn't got it. She's only got a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a crew. So I wonder what the sin is. I wonder what the sin is because this is her reaction to Elijah when the son gets sick. And Elijah calls for the son, and he took her out 
of her bosom, right? Oh boy. And carried him up to a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? Now get this. He stretched himself upon the child three times. Three times, right? And he cried unto the Lord and said, O my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul, soul come into him again. And then the word of the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child come into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered, <laughs> delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. Now, was and, and the woman says, Now that I know you are a man of God. Now this son, he wasn't dead, I don't think. Was he dead? I don't think he was dead because it says that there he, he fell sick and the, and the sickness was so sore that there was no breath in him. But we read down here that the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. So I don't know, was he dead? I only ask that because of the scripture we're about to go to. And the fact that Elijah stretched himself three times was how how many days was the Lord Jesus Christ in the in the belly of the earth for? Yeah, three days, wasn't it? I just wonder because it, it, it says he fell sick here. There was no breath left in him. But when Elijah intervened, the soul of the child came into him again. So that's telling me that the soul of the child wasn't in him so whether they're connected I, I, I don't know now the scripture in Luke where it's taking us to the Old Testament is the story where Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and this is after he had his 40 days he was tempted of the devil and he told the devil to get thee hence now he, after these things, he returned in the power of the Spirit. What does that mean exactly? He returned in the power of the Spirit into where? That's right, Galilee. We're back in the Galilee again, the circuit, the protective barrier of the womb. And don't forget, this is where the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the disciples when he was resurrected. And do you remember the other reason why the word Galilee is significant? So Galilee, circuit, district, a territory in Nepali, largely occupied by heathen. A circuit of towns around Kadesh, Nepali, in which was situated the 20 towns given to by Solomon to Huram, king of Tyre. Who's the king of Tyre? That's right, the anointed cherub that covereth as payment for his work in conveying timber from Lebanon to Jerusalem. So we're back into the cedars, my goodness gracious me. And in the New Testament, the word Galilee also means circuit. The name of a region of northern Palestine bounded, right, bounded on the north by Syria and on the west by Zidon, Tyre. I can try to say that and their territories, and the promontory of Carmel. Now remember Carmel, it means garden land. And remember that story I shared in a video a few months ago in First Kings 18. Now Ahab, he was the husband of Jezebel. Jezebel was his wife. And this is this most profound story in the Bible where Elijah tells him to get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, with it, put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now and look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass the seventh time, and he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's head. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass, in the meanwhile, 
that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab arose and went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance, the entrance right of Jezreel. And what does Jezreel mean? Jezreel means God sows. So Carmel means garden land. Jezreel means God sows. And in the New Testament description of Galilee, we've got it, it's on the promontory of Carmel. So this place, Galilee, is most profound indeed. Now let us not also forget that we've got two different scriptures that the Greek lexicon offers us for this word woman that's taking us to this word widow that basically started all this. And the second one is in 1 Kings 7.14. His father was a man of tire working in brass. And this is all about, this is all about the construction of this house. And I feel compelled to talk about something that's really been on my heart about this house. Brave in the Lord, brave in the spirit of truth. I really feel as though I've got to share what how I'm reading just the story of this temple and the way the Lord spoke to David and Solomon. But this video is now really starting to get out, so this is going to have to wait for another day, I think. This video, this video that was supposed to be all about this word man-child, and yet again it would appear... No, we ain't even going to get there. <laughs> and Jesus returned in the power, so he returns from his 40 days of being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and he returned in the power of the Spirit. Now, is Satan the king of Tyre? And he returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Round about, right? the circuit, the womb, the protective layer round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, the Nazarite. And I've done videos on, on the Nazarite. They're separated from their brethren. Uh, Samson. Samson was a Nazarite. And there's scriptures there about Joseph, the great prince, being separate from his brethren, where he had been brought up. And his custom was, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I, I feel as I'm getting closer and closer to understanding what this Sabbath is, but no, I still don't know what the Sabbath is. And he stood up for a read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, and anointed, Christ means anointed, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering sight to the blind. Right? He's done that to us, hasn't he? We can now see. To set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It just makes me think that about that scripture in Galatian when the days were fulfilled, right? And he closed the book. So this is the moment where he closes the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So done. Everything about Isaiah at this point is done. So has this got something to do with being tempted 40 days in the wilderness? Has it got something to do with Joshua? Because Joshua and Jesus, Jesus both mean Jehovah is salvation. And Joshua was only one of two Israelites to survive. I could just go on and on. But he went into the land of Canaan for 40 days to scope out the land. So Jesus has just returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, the place where he was resurrected. The, the, the place where the, the, the 20 towns that King Solomon gave to the king of Tyre. He's just come back from Satan, right? And Jesus is all about restoring that which was lost. 
I, 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 I just can't help but think all of this is connected somehow. And, and all bear in witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So this is where we come into the story about, about Elijah, about, about the prophecy and widow, right? Is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, ye, shall, ye, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself, whatsoever we have heard done in Copernicum, also here in thy country. Now, Copernicum, it means village of comfort. A flourishing city of Galilee, right? Situated on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee or Lake of Genesaret, near the place where the Jordan flows into the lake. And it gives a couple of scriptures here connected with the Old Testament. H3723 and 5151. And they mean village. So in the Old Testament, we see it a couple of times, the word villages. And this one's really interesting. Nahum, comfort. And this is the, he was the prophet that, that talked about the destruction and the fall of Nivea. And Nivea was the city that that Jonah went to, that, that, the, that he hid from the face of the Lord. This is the city that Jonah went to. And it, it's got something to do as well with the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 10.8, And Cush begat, begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, where it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And at the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalnek, and the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashua. Now, Ashua, he was the second born of Shem. He was the second born of Shem and Ashua, he was the Assyrian. So let's just take stock here. So in Luke 4, we've got Jesus returning full of the Holy Ghost after being tempted from the devil and his returning of the power of the Spirit into Galilee, the very place he was resurrected, the very place where Solomon had sold the 20 towns to the king of Tyre, who's the anointed cherubim that covereth. And we've got him talking about the story we read about Elijah in the, in the book of Kings, when he's talking to the the, the widow woman that I, that I shared before. So this place, Copernicum, it means village of comfort, and it's a city of Galilee, situated on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee of Lake Genesaret where Jordan flows into the lake. And that, that the, the Chaldee lexicon is taking us to a scripture in Nahum, Nahum 1.1, 1, 1, the burden of Nibia. And then Nibia is the city that Ashua built after he went out of the Tower of Babel. And remember, Ashua is the second born of Shem. And after that, that one there, this is the lineage that goes down all the way down to to Abraham. And the Assyrians, they're the neighbours of Samaria and, and Jerusalem, the two whoredom daughters of the one mother we read about in Ezekiel 23. She doted on her lovers, on Assyrians, her neighbours, horsemen riding upon horses, right? They, and she committed her whoredoms with them with all the all of them that were chosen men of Assyria and with all the idols she defiled herself. This is where we come down to this most profound scripture in verse 20. For she doted upon their paramours, concubines, whose flesh is the flesh of asses and whose issue, which means semen, men's contribution to making baby, whose issue was like the issue of horses. So this place, Nivea, then leads me to Matthew 12. And this is where Jesus is talking about the prophet Jonah because he went to Nivea and he's talking about the men of Nivea shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonas is here. And the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment and this I think refers to the story where Sheba Queen Sheba, I think it was in 1 Kings 10, came to visit Solomon when he was at the peak of his power. 
to see to to learn of because she'd learn of his wisdom and she come to see it for his, for herself shall rise up in judgment with this generation shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of solomon right and behold a greater than solomon is here so this is all all of this is just connecting back to solomon it's just to me it's connecting solomon and, and jesus Jesus came to restore that which was lost. I just can't shake the feeling all of this is connected. I can't, I don't know, I just can't get it. But it's, but, it's, but it's there. There's something mighty brewing here. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, many widows, here we go into this story, right? Many widows were in Israel in the day of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. But none, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sapria. Now this is the same lady that we talk about in the story in Kings that we're talking about. A city of Sidon, right? A city of Sidon unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisus the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now this is that story of the, he, he went and he, he didn't want to, he didn't want to soak. He was told by, it was either Elijah or Elisha to go and bathe in the Jordan seven times. And he didn't want to do it. He got quite wroth. But when he went and did it, he was cleansed after it seven times, right? The River Jordan. That's where the children of Israel went over to be purified. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And he rose up and thrust him out of the city and led, led him into a brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But, but he passing through the midst of them, I, can't, I just, I don't know, there's something about this word midst as well. Of them he went his way. And he came down into Copernicum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine for his word and his power. And, and, and on it goes. So I, I, I just can't help to think that all of this is connected. Like it, it is that the fact he went into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan for 40 days. And then we're coming into, we've got, we've got Galilee, these towns of Galilee and Solomon and the temple and the house and the prince of Tyre. And, and he wasn't happy with these cities that, that Solomon gave him. And I, I just can't help to think that all of this is connected. And is it somehow connected to the great mystery? And is it connected to the lineage that we read in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, my heart of hearts? I feel like it very much could well be, but if it is, I can't make that link, but we continue to tread out this corn and try to and pray, pray to the Lord God of Israel and just try, try to get peace and settle on these things. And now let's go and return to this word man-child. No, 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 I'm just kidding. I can't believe it's happened again. It's been a real experience putting this video together because the whole way through it I've been thinking to myself well Brett you haven't even got to this word man child yet but the way it's just grown that that, that part I put down there yesterday afternoon about the lineage it just it just kept going and going it just kept growing and growing and the further I go on the more I'm seeing connections with Solomon and the king of Tyre the anointed cherub and the covereth they're just just the two stories are intertwined and they're very, very similar to me in that they were both full of wisdom and beauty and and Solomon seemed to go to him and he was perfect at one point, was the king of Tyre, wasn't he? He at one point was perfect and Solomon went to him to furnish that house and that house which I really, really want to talk about but I just haven't had time on this video that to me there just seems to be a there's just a communication breakdown between perhaps even David and the Lord or but Solomon and David because we've got this word loins and we've got this word seed and I just feel in my heart of hearts right now that this could be what we're talking about with the lineage because the seed of the woman the seed of the woman was the seed of Seth in, in Genesis 4.25 and in Revelation 12.17 we're reading that the seed of the woman are those who keep the commandments 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a funny old thing that I'm just, uh, as I finish this video, I'm up to the book of Micah. I've got about 15 pages of the Old Testament to go. So by the time I get this video up, I will be in the New Testament, basically on Christmas Eve. It's a, it's a funny old thing. And no, 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 I don't. I don't celebrate Christmas. I, I enjoy it with family. It's a difficult day for me with family because I've got to be very careful with what I say because I just seem to offend everybody when I speak the truth. So, But I, I'm of the opinion now that I'm, no, I'm not going to turn my back on my family because of my faith. No, quite to the contrary because that's not going to bring them closer to the Lord and I love my family and they love me. But I, I've got to, everything that I do and every word that I choose, it's, it's, I've got to make sure that I'm bringing them close and not pushing them away. And I can't, I can't force feed them. They've got to come to the truth. They've got to want to have the desire for the truth. And I'm there. I'm there to place little seeds where, wherever I can. And if they've got any questions or, or anything of the like, I, I will always be here for them. So that's sort of where I stand with all that. But and and, and Christmas Day, it's a really good chance to to spend some time with with my family. But I I know Christmas isn't about the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole thing of Christmas is is quite antichrist actually with the you know with the with the gluttonous eating and and the spending and the and the selfishness and 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 giving of gifts and and partaking in the world and and trying to outdo each other with who's getting the best gift and who's who's not. I, I just can't stand any of it. And I, I don't participate in it except I go and have lunch with my family and I just go and have some really good times times with them. So it's a funny old thing that I'm in the New Testament in a couple of days, just as I come into Christmas and all these Bible verses the day are coming through about the Lord Jesus Christ, just as I come into it, all of this stuff about the lineage and there, there's a marked difference there. I've been having a real good, long, hard think about this this morning, about what this could possibly be, and I can't, I can't think of it. I can't get any rest on it. That that, that it just went from David to Nathan, from Matthew to Luke, and we still end up at Joseph. And I, I, I just don't know what it is, and because the father's the same, the mother's the same, and I don't know what it is, but we, we, we start at David and we end up at, at, at Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ. I just don't know how that's possible because if I have kids now and my brother has kids, as the lineage goes up, it's going to be different people, isn't it? It's not going to be the same people. So there's something far, far more profound coming up about all this. And what about the great mystery? My goodness gracious me, there's something huge about the great mystery and I just feel as though it's tied in somehow with, with the Gentiles and this whole spirit flesh thing that I'm talking about. Just the connections with Leviticus 18.20 and Genesis 6.2 and Zechariah 13.7. There's just, to me, the scriptures are becoming very, very compelling that that's what we're talking about here. And as usual, the truth, the truth is protected by lies. And what is the lie? It's, it's lecturing everybody about their sex life and... And people are very, very happy to lecture other people about their apparent sin. But it's very, very important. It's very important that we know what a sin is like. I was speaking to, to, to Lizzie offline the other day there. And, and I, I received one of those, you know, those envelopes you get in the mail from the government with a clear, clear window on the front of it. And you're just looking, you go, oh, this is bad news. What was my initial reaction? Yeah, I feared it. I feared what the government were going to do to me, that they wanted money or they were going, going to do something to me, and I feared the world. I feared the system. I feared their strange gods, and I did not fear the Lord at that moment. And I went straight to the Lord, and I repented. And to me, that is a sin. That is far, far more of a sin than what you do in your sex life. Is your sex life some sort of sin? I've got no idea. The scriptures are not telling me that. Does the scripture isolate sex? I... No, I, I just don't think it does. It's not what I'm reading. It's all about them changing their image. It's all about moving away from the image of God and fearing the strange gods and and not fearing the Lord. And I just want to I want to finish this video just on a scripture I just read. So I've just read the book of Amos, and I just feel as though all this ties in. It comes from the book of Amos, chapter one, thirteen. Thus saith the Lord. For three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead that they might enlarge their border. 
So here we go again with this whole pregnant woman thing and, and the connection to the womb and the borders and he separated the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. What an amazing experience it has been putting this video together. It's my longest one. And for those of you who have managed to get to the end, thank you ever, ever so much. And just know that I have learned a ton while doing this video and I feel like I've got some confirmations, maybe a correction or two, but I feel very, very good in the Holy Spirit. I feel filled with the Holy Spirit and with the spirit of truth. So a video that really started off with some very, very compounding, a very, very profound comments there from Jamie just about the morning stars and now I'm starting to think that every single time we read these words rose up early in the morning it could well be talking about that because there was a scripture there in in Lamentations in Lamentations chapter 2 verse 1 how hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel remembered not his footstool in his day of his anger. This this word footstool now, man. Woo! I feel like doing a video on that, but I still feel like doing a video on man child, and I still feel like going with this woman and what's a man in the in the New Testament as well. There's so much more I want to do, but he cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel. And in Mark he, we read that he's gonna gather all these angels and gather his elect from the from, from all points of the heaven and and there's another one in the Old Testament that's very similar to it that I'll pull up on the screen now as well. And ah oh, to me there's just something huge about this celestial uh, about the, just who these children of Israel are, just who Paul is talking to in the New Testament, this whole spirit flesh thing, and just how I just am like, my eye, I'm coming up to my year anniversary next week of reading the Bible and still a babe in Christ probably, but just my observations, just, just coming into all this, that people are, a couple of things is that I don't want to speak ill of others, it's just my observations that people are, very very willing to be taught people want to teach people want to they they want the truth to be something that they want it to be something that they're comfortable with people are reading the bible in the flesh on one hand they're very very happy to it to accept that ephesians is talking about the full armor of god in the spirit but when it comes to the old testament that these words like armor and war and spear that they perhaps are about the about the spirits of the celestial fight as well they think you're mad and they were just people in the desert and all of these chariots were just these horse drawn things in the in the in the dark ages and it's just not how i'm reading the scriptures it's just not how they're coming across to me to me it's far far more profound than that and the other thing is people are hiding behind beliefs i believe this and then that's it. It's just like when I was in the world, all people have to say is, I'm offended. That's it. Conversation over. You've been victorious today. Well done. You rule the roost because you're offended. And it's exactly the same with people and their beliefs. Oh, don't you talk to this about them because they've got beliefs. And that's there's some of my observation of people are not putting the truth at what the center of what they do. So... Uh, this is the grand illusion I feel that's on the earth and it goes deep, deep, deep because there's very, very few people who are happy to be wrong, who don't have to be right, who don't care about having beliefs. They just want the truth and putting the truth at the centre of what they do. And you've got my absolutely uncategorical word that that is my commitment going forward is to the truth, to the spirit of, of truth to the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, as we continue to tread out this corn. Thank you again for everybody that's got this far. And as usual, I'd love to hear what you think if you so feel led. All right, my brothers and sisters, and all power and all glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, Woo! the King. I wish we'd all been ready Children die, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready, there's no time to change your mind.
the sun has come, you've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. You've been left behind